order, a uh, meeting of the CUSD Board of Education of January 9th, 2020. Welcome everybody and Happy New Year. Um, so we have a closed session item to start off the evening. Do we have any comment cards for closed session? No? Okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the board to closed session. We should be back in about 15 minutes to start with the um, regular uh, open, open session tonight. So adjourn to closed session. So I'm going to go ahead and call us back to order. Um, welcome to everybody who's come in while um, we have been at closed session. Uh, for item 3.3 on closed session, there is nothing to report. We will be reconvening to closed session uh, after we finish with the rest of the items on our agenda. Um, so we are ready to start with the flag salute. So I named Ariane and Maddie. And if everyone can please rise. <laughs> Hats and hoods off. Right hand over your heart, ready, salute. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. All right, uh, on to board agenda approval. <coughs> Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? Or uh, no, no changes. No changes tonight. So motion to approve the agenda. The list moves. I'll second the motion. Seconds. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, motion approved. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to move on to classify employee of the month. Um, so can I have? Um, our classified employee of the month, Margarito Medina, join us up front, please. Oh, he's not here. Okay, not able to be here with us tonight. Um, so, um, Margarito is being honored, um, was, was nominated by uh, our Dilworth principal, uh, Kristen Johnson, our Nimitz principal, Cardi Ito, uh, our assistant principal here at CMS, Jean Wang, um, and they all had wonderful things to say. Um, about him, um, that he takes much pride in his work, he's de dependable, detail-oriented, an excellent problem solver and team player, uh, that he has a charismatic personality which allows him to work well with others and lift the quality of their work as well, um, that he has great attention to detail and is a mentor um, to other employees within the organization. Um, and that they've seen a noticeable difference in the work quality of other site custodians when Margarito has the chance to work with them and mentor them. Um, that he's a problem solver no matter the task at hand. He faces the challenges um, and uh, with, a, with a, a great spirit and a, um, an attitude that's never, that's not possible or I don't have time, no matter how small or potentially petty or nitpicky the request, Margarito thoughtfully listens and gives an idea or a solution. Um, and he's very creative with, her, with his solutions, um, which they really appreciated. Um, and so they wanted to honor him for his dedication that he's demonstrated, um, as particularly throughout the sunny, summer clean, which was extraordinary, um, and uh, that they know that our schools are always um, well taken care of when they are in his hands. Um, so I don't know if anybody else wanted to say anything tonight. I just want to say he's not here tonight because I called him and he said because of the shortage of custodians tonight, if he came tonight, somebody's classroom did not get clean. So he's out there cleaning. All right, so thank you to Margarita Medina for being out there and cleaning classrooms tonight. Um, thank you, Terry, for sharing that with us. Um, so we will make sure that he gets um, this small token of appreciation from the board as well as the certificate for the honor. Um, and that's it. Okay. Um, 
So moving on, item 6-4, uh, our school highlight tonight, um, which is our Nimitz Writing Workshop, uh, second grade lab reports. Um, so I'm gonna ask Allison and Carrie, oh, and then, um, to go ahead and uh, come up and introduce. Good evening. Uh, we are excited to share with you tonight the work that second grade students are engaged in at Nimitz Elementary School. Um, our focus is on writing workshop integrated with science. In addition, it sort of highlights how the tenets of our strategic plan come to life in our classrooms. So it's my pleasure to introduce Carrie Ito. Good evening, board. We are really excited to be here this evening and to share the work of our second grade team. The units of study writing program that our schools have had the opportunity to participate in is a true testament of our strategic plan because the personalized learning that goes straight along with it goes well with our strategic plan and it fits well with student learning. So we're really excited about that tonight. I'd like to introduce our three teachers that are here. We have three second grade teachers, Pam Wu, Shauna Rudin, and Casey Martinez, and they'll come up with their students. My name is Maggie. My name is Corey. <laughs> My name's Ariani. My name is Anna. My name's Adi. As Lucy Calkins and her team has found, this type of writing is one way to reach reluctant writers. <laughs> Students that are not fond of writing find they are excited about it when they are recording and explaining what they have learned while performing a high interest science experiment. During the first experiment, all the student scientists used the same design. After completing the process, we were encouraged to make an improvement to the original design. <coughs> this was an this was Anna Anna's original design, and this was my partner and my original design of the catapult. The first page of the report is the question, what do we want to discover? Using a catapult, we did which will go farther, the ping pong ball or a cotton ball. Our hypothesis is what we think will happen. My hypothesis is that the ping pong ball will go farther because it is smoother and has less friction. The next page is our materials. What do we need to conduct this experiment? You will need one cotton ball, one ping pong ball, one to each roller, one rubber band, one six inch plastic spoon, one meter stick and tape. We also have our procedures page. On this page, we write step-by-step -step procedures to conduct the experiment. <coughs> Next, we have the results and observations page. We record the results of our experiments in an organized way. This is the ping pong results and this is the cotton ball results. our conclusions page. We conclude our lab report by reflecting on our hypothesis and giving possible examples of our results. In conclusion, my hypothesis was correct because the ping pong ball was lighter and made out of plastic, not fluff. 
It might have also been because of how much force was put in a catapult. When comparing my cotton ball and ping pong ball results with another scientist, I noticed that the balls always went a farther distance than the other scientist's results. We used a, oh, based on our conclusion, we had new question to be investigated. How can we revise our, how can we revise our catapult to make it shoot both the cotton ball and ping pong ball farther than they went with the original design? We, we used the block to make the real catapult higher and a revised catapult, we would, for our procedures, we would hold it down with, on the handle and fling it with our thumb and it would go a further distance than the original design. Um, getting this little glimpse inside some project-based learning going on over at Nimitz. It's been such a treat tonight. Um, so we have some certificates uh, for the students, and if the board will join me, maybe we can get a picture. Uh, so next up, item 6.5, our student recognition for our Thank Our Teacher Award from Staples. I think Norma is doing that for us. Thank Hi everybody, I'm Norma Salas, the principal at Ragnar, and I'm really, I'm excited to be here tonight to share some like really exciting news. Uh, during the back to school shopping season, um, the first day of school, one of our students, Sienna Tolmino, she'll come up in a little bit, she visited the local Staples store because, you know, she got her first day of school supplies and she needed a new folder and all those things, and so mom went and took her to the store and there had to thank a teacher contest going on and she asked her mom could she enter it and mom was like well we, we need to go and then Sienna you know wanted to convince some convincing she got her to let her write a note and so what they did is on a post-it note they were to write a note to their teacher and so uh, after her second attempt because the first attempt was messy according to mom and so she wrote on there that her teacher from last year mrs poncini was the best teacher ever and mrs poncini is here tonight and then um, actually tonight sienna shared with her mom that she wanted to enter the contest because she was hoping that mrs poncini would see it and um, she wanted to spread some kindness in the world. So um, Yari, post, her mom posted on Twitter, and it was one of those contests where you know they randomly, they, they pick, and um, we, she, we were notified that she was a finalist for a $10,000 Staples gift card for the school. And just before um, Thanksgiving break, we were notified we won, so we have, um, after a little bit, there was some, it's coming from the East Coast, actually, and um, I was like, oh, is it going to come? Is it going to come? And it came, it was supposed to come right before Thanksgiving break, and then there was some bad weather in the Midwest, and so I was like, oh, no, we're going on break. Is it going to come? But it did come the day, one of the days during Thanksgiving break, and so we have our $10,000 staple gift cards. There are actually five of them. They can't give us just one. Um, so we're really excited and grateful to have this um, have this happen to our school. It'll really definitely help us out. Um, so we have also Rianne Pearson 
Leanne, I'm sorry, Pearson from Staples, who wants to say a few words, and we also want to invite Sienna up so that we can congratulate her and thank her. and one of 10 winners right here, this little girl who made this magic happen. And I'm so excited that I get to be the store that's part of this also, so thank you so much. And this is something from Staples Cupertino for you, gift card for 50 bucks for you. Um, so I'm going to have my back to you all a little bit. Sorry about that. 
Um, so uh, I would be lying if I didn't say I'm happy that this is our last uh, uh, middle school round, having done this, uh, I don't know how many times, not just the five times, but obviously at many of the schools as well. Uh, and I'm glad that we'll be at the end of our listening session uh, coming up uh, tonight so that the board can deliberate on the 23rd of January, so coming up very soon uh, at long last. And uh, as you know, our, our goal here really is for me to give you a little history and context uh, to review the data that is specific to Cupertino Middle School and its feeder elementary schools. Um, and then to just listen and we'll give any community member that uh, wants a chance to uh, address the board to give thought. We won't be discussing it uh, today, uh, just uh, listening. It is a listening session. So with that, let us go to the next slide. Who's in charge of that? Is that you, Leslie? Are you on it? All right, thanks. Um, so uh, as you know, we always start with the, uh, the numbers, looking at what is the issue around district and declining enrollment. And uh, just looking up there, 2015-16, uh, we were close to 19,000. And the year before that, we were over 19,000, by the way, and very close to 20,000, not uh, long before that. And then, so just over the last few years, we've already we've dropped until today 16, 7, 12. That number's changed a little bit. It changes every day, to be honest, but we're close to that. And uh, the predictions over the next few years is that we're going to drop all the way down to 14,262. The reality is that we have projections beyond that, and it keeps going down a little bit after that. But we thought at, once you get to 24, 25 school year, we don't have a lot of, um, uh, there's not a lot of reliability in the numbers, so we thought we'd just stop at that. But just note that at 4,648 students that we will have lost over that time, that uh, equates for the uh, district to be um, basically around $45 million of revenue because we receive our funds on a per pupil basis. Um, as I always uh, tell people, 60% of that is mitigated, meaning that because we uh, don't need as many teachers, because we don't have as many students, we don't need as many materials and things like that. We, uh, the, it's really only the 40% of that that is a, um, a loss to the district in terms of our ability to run programs. But fit, as you can imagine, $15 million a year in our district is uh, a lot of money, uh, year after year after year. And that is our big challenge. It, it is both that and it's also, of course, a balancing enrollment issue. Declining enrollment in, in and of itself is not necessarily a problem, but it is for us because we're a district that receives funds on a per pupil basis. Um, so uh, this slide, and you all have seen it, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, it's just uh, reminding us of how many um, different committees have been working over many years since 2013, grappling with the question of what are we gonna do about balancing our enrollment uh, because, as you know, we have one school, one elementary school that at the time, especially uh, in uh, 2017, we had uh, about uh, nearly 1,200 students in an elementary school. And then we had other schools that were at 300 uh, or less. And so the imbalance in the district, uh, we kind of started our conversations around that, around, around that topic about balancing it because they're so out of whack. But, and at the same time, we have to find enrollment, which became the next problem, which is both uh, exacerbates the balance question, but also uh, adds to it the economic problem that comes with that as well. So, um, yeah, I won't go into that. You, you can read all those. Uh, in 2018-19, after the CAC, the Citizens uh, Advisory Committee, um, uh, had, uh, I, I had taken that work, brought that to the board, we talked about it, and, uh, and said, well, where do we go from here? Because that committee did not have the charge to actually come up with solutions, per se, but really just to generate ideas and brainstorm and look at some potential ideas that were, they were not charged with an actual um, plan of any kind. So um, the school board looked at information, they asked the question, well, how do we know if a school is too big or too small? What, what are the criteria that make that? And so uh, our committee then looked at it and we had conversations and talked about efficiency of running school. We talked about programmatically uh, in order for teachers to have enough uh, colleagues at a particular grade level to collaborate as professionals, for kids to have enough um, 
diversity that they can change classes and be in classrooms with other kids instead of being in, you know, the smaller you get, sometimes you're in the same class with kids for your entire career um, in, in school. So there's all different reasons, and again, including economic efficiency. And where we landed is that we want our kindergarten, our elementary schools to have at least three kindergarten classes, and then that number of students roll up every year, so that generally speaking, you have three uh, classes per grade, although they, they blend together in fourth and, and fifth because the class sizes go up. Um, and so uh, basically the, the stake in the ground that the board gave, uh, made at that point was that our, our small schools can be as small as 432 or 72 kindergarten, uh, or 72 for a grade, I should say. Um, and that the sweet spot really is it probably in the four and five kindergarten uh, classes or 576 to 720 kids. Sweet spot there both programmatically and economically for the district. And then um, six is economically uh, uh, very beneficial for us, but it is, you're starting to get a little bit big. And for a district that has uh, said that our strategic plan talks about um, how important it is to know every child and for, for children to know adults and to be known by adults, that it starts to get a little bit harder when you get to be um, that size. So um, basically, that's where we left it. And the charge that the then board gave me was to come up with a plan for how we get to this, essentially. Balanced enrollment, efficiently run schools. And that's where we are today. So, um, what we did back then is say that, well, instead of coming up with a real quick plan, why don't we take some of the uh, recommendations of that CAC and look at what can we do that's not too drastic. And um, basically, what we talked about is, uh, what if we talked to all the smaller schools and said, do you have thoughts about how you might create uh, magnet schools or themes that would draw uh, people to come to the school that the district would work with you to build something if you have interest in that and, and then we changed all of our policies to allow open enrollment so that any family anywhere in the district could uh, request to go to another school and then we tried to promote small schools and, and we added that we would provide dawn to the dusk after school programs a preschool TK at the school so that there was this continuum. We could attract people into the preschool program, keep them there, uh, they would want to stay. And then the board said, what if, what if we did that for about a year, see if that's making a difference, if it's working, where it makes a difference, et cetera, and track that progress and then bring it back, and that's kind of where we are today. Is uh, I'm gonna be showing you some data about where we are specifically with the Cupertino Middle School feeder pattern. So, um, uh, note that, uh, just so everybody's on the same page, that first column is the 2017-18 uh, school year, and then the following year, so for Cupertino, it says 1426. Uh, um, Cupertino has been our largest middle school. Uh, that is a bit larger than we would want. It, it dropped down by 68 students, and then this year, they are right now right around 13, 23, is that what it says? Mm -hmm. Uh, so another uh, negative 35 in blue, in that blue column, that is the projection for next year. And we're generally really close on our next year projection just because we know how many sixth graders, I mean, yeah, fifth graders are coming into sixth grade and we know how many eighth graders are going out. We're relatively stable and so uh, we, we we're pretty sure of that number. So that shows that over that um, basically three year period, you have a drop of 201 students, which is a lot in a short period of time, the, the upside is that Cupertino could use to um, lose a few students because it's a little bigger than we wanted to have uh, happen. Now Stoppelmeyer was our school that was basically around 1,200 students uh, a few years ago, in fact, 1190 back in 1718. And uh, you can see there that over that three year period, they're losing 191 students. Now that one is pretty manufactured because that is the one where based on the stake in the ground how many kids you should have, they had 11 kindergarten classes at that time. 
And so we, we made the rule that we're only going to fill them up to a certain number. I think our, we were targeting just losing one or two kindergarten classes every year for a little while. But it, and it did drop to nine and to seven this year. Is that right? Yeah, so that, that, that's precipitous, and, and you can tell that, uh, just think about, it. now if you hold at that every single year for a while, that number's going to come down, it's going to get us pretty close to that, not wanting it to be more than 800, that's what our, our goal is, but that is, um, again, it's manufactured in that we have to tell people who are showing up that do still live in that area, it is still our most, um, you know, crowded uh, neighborhood. <clears throat> so it's not, it's not that that has changed, it's just that we, we've sort of uh, said we're just not going to allow the school to be as big as it has been or has, has become. These other schools, uh, on the other hand, that's all natural um, uh, decline. And just uh, for people who haven't seen these slides before, just know every single school that we have in the district um, pretty much has dropped uh, over that three year period. So the decline is not in any one place. The problem is that in areas that already had really small schools, those schools have, are getting really, really small, way smaller than our target of um, three classes per grade. Um, whereas in these, they started at a higher number. Montclair at 416 was our, our smallest back then. They have maintained, I'm mean, working from the bottom, they pretty much maintained that the, that's a, a minus 14. Had we not done open enrollment though and started preschool there, um, they would not be at that number. They, that was a, a very active um, group saying we, we want to make sure that we reach that basically 420-ish mark. So we're seeing some progress there. Um, now the other schools, though, they've all been relatively high between 536 and 6 something um, in 1718. You can see the drop there. Uh, but what you have to note is that because there are six grades in elementary, you know, from K through five, if you have year after year of this same thing and you hold that for a while, that number is going to keep growing. The, the, the drop, once they get to middle school, is going to be more on Cupertino. But if you look at those numbers, it's, it's only going to bring Cupertino down essentially to, um, you know, 1,100 students, which is not... That's not a bad thing. You know, of course, that our middle schools at 1,100, that will not be a problem. But as I said, the uh, decline is projected to continue beyond um, that 24, 25 year that we're using. All right, so um, we've been sharing just wait lists because all of our schools um, are open uh, enrollment schools. You can request to go there. And um, that just gives you a, a sense. Collins, because Collins was 700 and uh, I think 80 students. Uh, where was Collins? Collins was. So 750, right? So it was uh, higher than that the year before. So they have always been right on the cusp of being a uh, school larger than we would want. So, um, and it is, as you can see, it's a very popular school. Those numbers you see, the 26, 29, uh, et cetera. Uh, just remember, those are not overflow students who belong to the school who we had to put elsewhere. Those are actually people outside that neighborhood requesting to get into it. And then the others you can see, and this is the pattern, uh, the best of columns is a lot. That's one of our schools that is requested um, more than many. Um, and the others, though, do generally have, in, you know, uh, two to ten uh, in any grade. <clears throat> but it's generally never enough to open another uh, classroom at those schools. Um, right, so um, uh, this is the slide that really takes from all of the uh, various committees, primarily from the CAC, but then from some of the other committees that met uh, both before and after. And it is only a laundry list. These are not recommendations, uh, just to be clear. I think that some people misunderstood this when they saw the slide out of context. It was just saying that there were all sorts of strategies around attracting people in to schools, like uh, creating magnet schools and alt schools, either new ones or expanding them. Uh, keep going with the dawn to dusk and charter schools. Um, has been raised uh, as a possibility, open enrollment and interdistrict transfers, um, which we did. Again, we opened up with an open enrollment and, and interdistrict. That is something we are doing now, with some success in some places and not so much in others. 
so then uh, we, the other one was to reconfigure, you know, like uh, creating different grades in schools or uh, rezoning, changing the boundaries. There's all sorts of things you can do like that. Um, and that's what that set is about, uh, just reconfiguring the district. And then there's others about consolidating schools, um, which usually impacts smaller uh, schools. But in some districts, they're doing that actually with schools that aren't necessarily small. It's just that uh, there's other reasons for um, for uh, you know, their reasoning behind it. But that is one uh, of the solutions that uh, is out there. And um, a lot of talk about can you change where all the schools are as well. And uh, there's always been tied to any and all of those is what about busing. And uh, generally speaking, uh, what all the committees have said is there isn't any one solution. And so we're likely going to have to do some combination of a few different things that we see out there. Excuse me. Okay, how am I supposed to see that? <laughs> oh, that's how. Okay, so uh, can you get a little bit bigger, please? Thank you. And now can you read me the number? No, I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is uh, just the list people, uh, when we first started going out, people were asking, well, how many kids do we have going to the alternative schools? And um, so what you're looking at is all of our um, elementary schools, non-alt on the left, and then uh, for Rhea, Murdoch, Michelle, McCall, and Cliff, the various all schools, and how many students this year, these are, uh, this is this year's numbers. Um, and so you can see with Lou Hales, for example, they have 96 students who live in their neighborhood who are going to those all schools. Um, note that there are 2,100 and something uh, I think our new number is 2156 or something as of today, I looked at it. Um, but it's basically, you know, 2100 students, um, and there's also a wait list of 1001 something at the bottom there, I think, um, as well. So what I do want to point out, because I, uh, after we did the first one, we realized we left this other column over here that shows um, what the uh, enrollment is. So Blue Hills, it shows 315 or something are enrolled in the school right now. And if you added it to the 96 that go out, well, that would get you to the 420 something. Uh, but we realized that that's just not a good number. It's an unfair number. And so we, we have graded out to say that was an error on our part. The reason that's a problem is because, number one, um, those 315 students that are there, about almost 100 of them, are, no, I think it's 80 for that, something like that, um, are not uh, actually neighborhood anyway. They, they're there because we opened and rolled. So it's not, it wasn't apples to apples, but the more important thing perhaps is that, and we have no idea what those 96 students would do if there were not an alt school, what would their choice be? Would it still be to go to the neighborhood school? So it's really just not a fair or um, genuine number, and so we have just stayed away from it. But it is important just to know that our alt schools remain extremely popular. And again, is that, is it 1,000, what is it? 1,152, I think, um, uh, on a wait list to get into them as well. So obviously very popular choice really uh, matters as we've heard in many of these listening sessions uh, to date. All right, so going forward, uh, you know, in a minute, we're going to do our listening session, hear from anybody here today um, if they want to add anything to the mix so that you can consider all that uh, in two weeks from tonight, January 23rd, and um, we're, you're uh, going to review that, those data, we're going to review everything that we've been hearing, we'll discuss that, we're going to discuss criteria for making decisions, and then identify next steps. The, the one next step we know, um, well not next next, but by the end of the school year, you charge me with bringing forth at least some sort of plan, uh, plan for you to consider uh, for how we might resolve uh, the issues that we have, which are somewhat convoluted in that it's both about balancing enrollment but also about budget problems that we have associated with declining enrollment. So um, we're still on target to do that. Uh, it is. As we've talked about, it's because of that timeline and we, and we won't have a, even a, a first plan in front of you, that means there will be no changes next school year, um, or at least no forced changes, uh, just because there, there won't be any time. So whatever plan is put forth would um, likely not take effect anyway, at least by the 21-22 school year. All right, I think that's it.
Okay, so um, before I go into the listening, ooh, I've got loud when I push it to the center, is that okay? All right. Um, so uh, before I go into the listening session instructions, does anybody have any clarifying questions they want to ask Craig now? Okay, pretty good. All right, so um, just because we've been giving a sort of a consistent set of um, information and instructions at each of these board meetings, I hope you're gonna forgive me for reading at you for just one moment. Um, we've heard from many community members over the past few months and look forward to listening to our community again tonight. Staff and board members have held multiple meetings at schools with parents, community members, and with school staffs. Board members have received many emails and we have met with various individuals and groups from our schools. Please know that we are listening carefully and we will carefully consider all of the diverse input when we do, do wind up deliberating later on this month on this issue for the first time. We also know that there's confusion out there, as Dr. Baker referred to, about whether our decisions moving forward will be based on budget, balance and enrollment, or a combination of both. Um, and so we've heard that feedback, we continue to hear that feedback and we're gonna do our best to address that moving forward. Um, the purpose of this listening session is to hear from you, the members of our CMS community and the feeder schools into CMS about enrollment. Any thoughts or ideas you have regarding this topic will be taken into consideration as we begin our discussion later this month. As you know, we, are, we have held now a listening session at each of our middle schools, so all of our communities have had the opportunity to speak to this same topic. Um, the session has been filmed and the video will be available on the website in the next few days. Uh, to maintain our time commitment and to hear from as many as possible, it will be important for all of us to adhere to some ground rules. Um, to save time, there will be no comment cards tonight. If you wish to speak when it's time, when we let you know, um, we're going to ask you to just go ahead and line up and check in with one of our staff members um, who will have a clipboard to just expedite the process. Um, when you come up to the microphone, please state your name and your school community or affiliation. Please speak clearly into the microphone so that we have clear audio when we go back to post the video. We'd ask that there's no applauding or cheering for remarks. If you agree and you want to support the speaker, just a show of hands, raising hand can be a great way to show that support or that you agree with what the speaker has to say. If you have any questions, um, we will make note of them and consider them when we deliberate. At the end of public comment, board members will have a few minutes to ask any clarifying questions if any are generated from that. Um, but again, there won't be any official discussion tonight. The reason for these rules is to maximize the time so that we can hear from all speakers and we can for your cooperation. Um, so really quick, just to take a show of hands, if you're planning to speak tonight, just so we can kind of gauge how many people for comments. One, two, okay, so we should be able to allot our three minutes, no problem, um, so we'll do that. Per person, yes, sorry, thank you. And um, really quick, we've also just been doing sort of a, a quick straw poll um, with a show of hands, so I'm gonna read a couple of statements, and if they resonate with you, if you just uh, raise your hand so that the board can see, we've been trying to ask these questions as we've been going to each site. So we know there are fears and concerns about closing schools whether they be neighborhood or alternative schools. And many community members would like for this option to be taken off the table completely. Can you raise your hand if that statement resonates with you? Okay, thank you. Um, leaving aside for a moment the question of any potential school closures, if we shift and we're thinking only about our alternative programs, expansion, shrinking, or having to move any of our alternative programs, um, and the potential impacts that might have on those uh, schools, if that's a concern for you, will you raise your hand? Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, potential solutions for balancing both our enrollment and our budget, small schools would like more time to come up with ways to attract more students to their sites, communicate and advertise proactively um, for people who live within our community, but also for those who potentially might live outside the district that statement resonates with you. Okay, great. Um, and then many of you would like more clarity about the degree to which we are trying to solve a budget problem as compared to addressing the balancing of enrollment across the district. If that statement resonates with you, can you show your hands? Great, thank you. Um, so, so noted. Um, so if you are planning to speak, if you would come up and check in with Leslie and we'll get you right up to the mic to make a comment. Any brave 
is sold tonight for a public comment. <laughs> Start with name and Hi, my name is Essen Salter, and my daughter goes to McCulloch. Um, and I just wanted to say that I really appreciate Cupertino having alternative schools available. It's a really wonderful program, and I'd be sorry to see them go. So my my vote would be to work to keep alternative schools and to help work alternative programs into the existing schools we have. Right, thank you. Bias, uh, representing, I should say, at Montclair Elementary School. It's been a while since I've been introduced. <laughs> um, two things that I'm thinking about as you go through the presentation that I hope will impact your, the strategic decisions that you're making, and I do appreciate all of these listening sessions. Actually, three things. One is that I think it would be helpful for our community, and I'm hoping that you'll give the information about what was said at the other listening sessions, because I have no doubt that what our feedback and our input is and our issues are so different than some of the other schools where they might be a set of a lot of the smaller schools and not, like I feel like I'm coming from a place where we're the largest middle school and we're actually concerned about being a big middle school and a small elementary school going to a big middle school feeds into some of my thinking. Um, and in that light, um, I would love to see some statistics, you commented on it shortly, around what is really that sweet spot for a size of middle schools and then have some of that be some of the strategic piece that drives into those decisions to say, what do we really want our middle schools to look like? And then how do we build that platform underneath it to impact the size going into it? With that said, in my mind, I, in the reconfigure ideas, one that I'm drawn to is the idea of going back to K-6 for elementary school and potentially 7-8 for middle school because that could potentially add some numbers to our elementary schools and make our middle schools a little bit smaller. Um, as a former middle school teacher, I know that large middle schools, it's a real challenge to teach in those and a lot of things become about size over program and I'd love to see it be more about program than size. Thank you. office in terms of um, to be able to pull in staff for our different board advanced topics and um, you know the ability to set up the space and also to live um, to live feed our, our video from the district office that we're not able to do from remote sites versus um, space available and so the, the question is does anybody have a strong feeling on a venue and if if one option was the district office and being able to have overflow space on the um, if, if it becomes an issue for needing overflow capacity versus having it at a big venue um, and dealing with some of the logistical challenges we've been dealing with at, at having remote sites, does anybody have a, an opinion either way or should we put it in the hands of staff to? I just have a comment. Yeah. I think, um, I have no idea how many people are going to expect that night, so it's difficult to say what would be best. But I think people get cranky if they come to a meeting and they can't get in, or they can't be heard, or they can't see. 
So my bias, I guess, would be to, even if we had a small group, to have a large venue, just so we don't run into the problem of people not having space. Our boardroom is pretty small. Just my two cents. Okay. Anybody else have any feelings? My sense is that there's going to be a lot of people just based on people talking to me. Okay. So you're, you're here that you think there's going to be a lot of show in person as opposed to watching video feed? Okay, so even if we couldn't live video feed it, your preference would be a larger space. I mean, I think I'm just, I don't have a personal preference. I'm just thinking yeah. for accommodations purposes, if there's going to be more people. And I think I, I agree with Phyllis. Okay. I, I do think some of the schools we had more acoustic problems and less acoustic problems than others, so maybe yeah. that could be. The, this one's been okay. Some of ours have been really yeah. challenging, yes. <laughs> um, okay. yeah, this one we don't think is available <coughs> problem. So, but with, uh, Lawson is one that we're holding on to. And I do want to clarify that if we did, uh, and, and I wanted to clarify one thing, the, the first part of the meeting in the afternoon will not be the listening session and conversation. We're going to take care of other business because we didn't want to start that until at least 5.30 or so, because we know that some you know, parents couldn't make it. So we're, we'll take care of other kind of business uh, prior. We'll take a quick uh, dinnerish break, and then we'll continue with that session. Uh, but I, I do want to say that we, we do feel we can set up the district office with um, streaming video there you know, in other rooms and set up other chairs and have other venues. People can then come in if they wanted to say something really gets that big. I actually, because we can get 75 to 80 chairs in there um, and then have some standing room, I'm, I'm not so sure that I, we will have more than that, to be honest. I, I do know that there's a set of people that will come, but I don't know if it's going to be better than that. At the same time, I, I understand wanting to play it safe in case it is much bigger, so we can do that. Have we ever split locations, done, done the advanced topics? At one location, because it's, it's an advance where you're just having an earnest conversation, it's kind of hard to redo it. You know, in the business. I, th I, I think we did it within our hours, switching venues from one to the other. Oh, we did talk about doing that as a possibility, but we just thought it's and then you're kind of double setting up, and it's, okay. it's a little complicated. So, so multiple uh, schools, uh, like you know, the rooms kind of things would be better than the gym kind of place is too big of a place, I think, and sitting for six hours, kind of. Uh, so it could be between like you know our ballroom and this size, maybe some so, like an image view, we go right kind of. GLC is multiple. Okay, so what I would say is that if, if, uh, if you would leave in our hands what's the best possible location, we'll think of things like Nimitz and other options beyond the gym where maybe the acoustics are a little yeah. bit better. Um, but without all of the site, without us getting bogged down here because all sites have a different problem and upside. And, but it, it, it's really just more are we okay at the district office or do you want us to think of something that's a little larger and if it's the latter, then just we'll, we'll figure the right place. And we'll yeah, I think that I would agree with Phyllis saying like you're on the side of having the capacity. And I, I would I guess I prefer the district office to a gym. I prefer a place like Nimitz to the district office in terms of so this echo I think for me it's it feels weird and I feel like I'm in a canyon. So uh, yeah. So yeah. Okay. Point. I think that's what we'll do. Yeah. And so then I just wanted to uh, also say that uh, just based on what you know so far, we were not having any discussion today, but are there anything you can think of that are more data points or materials or anything that you're wanting staff to bring? Our, our goal really is to, um, you know, we staff and the committee will reflect back what we think we heard um, from all of these. Uh, we'll ask you to do some personal reflection on that and talk a little bit about uh, what stands out for you and what's, what's on your mind and what you're thinking. And we'll go through some exercises to come up with criteria for uh, how do we even make a decision about what we want to do. And so I'll, I'll lead us through an exercise like that. And then we'll talk a lot about process going forward. Um, what about the citizens? committee again, uh, what should that look like, 
what what is the timeline looking like? What are some touch points over the course of the year? You know, so this is going to be likely a good you know uh, two to three hour conversation that we that we'll be having. And so I would just say if there's anything you can think of, and even if not today, but after, if you want to just send me a a message, we, we want to collect that in order to finish the agenda and make sure we're bringing the right materials. So I'll just, uh, there are a few things I guess I'll just add to the pot. The first I think is a sort of a clear problem definition or objective. What are this we're solving for? To the extent uh, we can be as quantitative as possible, I know some of these are sort of qualitative in nature. So one would be a clear objective of what we're solving for. And then second, I think it's just really financial information around budgets both current, uh, future projected, and past. I think we, in these listening sessions, we've seen a lot of information on enrollment uh, trends and such, but uh, less so on the budget side. So just find whatever financial information you think would help us. I appreciate it. Yeah, our our intent is to do um, a, a good, probably a, a one hour conversation just focus on budget because we know that that's an issue. We'll bring them all to the Okay. Anybody else? Do you have what you need? I think so, thank you. Okay. All right, so moving on, uh, agenda 10, consent. Um, let's see, so first we need a motion on approval of the monthly warrant listing purchase order for um, 10.1 Apple only. I move to approve item 10.1. A second? A second. All right, so Jerry and Phyllis, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? One recusal, which is me. Okay, um, next is items 10.2 uh, through 10.10. .10. Uh, the rest of the items on consent. Can I get a motion for? I move to approve items 10.2 through 10.10. .10. So be a motion and a second. Aye, and second. And Satish second. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And no abstentions or recusals on that one. Uh, motion passes. Uh, actually, I should have said that on both. Motion passes. Uh, four zero one recusal um, by myself on ten one, and then ten two through ten nine. Um, motion passes by both. Uh, item eleven. Moving on to information and presentations. Eleven dot one quarterly William quarterly report on Williams uniform complaints. Allison. If there's no, not going to be anything, it's zero again. Do you want anything? So I think we're good. I think we'll just accept it from you. Sorry for making you come up. <laughs> All right. Um, and then 11-2, uh, District Independent Audit Report 2018-19. So Jeff? Okay, and Dorothy's going to come up for us. Good evening. Uh, this item is brought as information item. Uh, the purpose of this independent audit is to assure that we are in um, alignment with all the state mandates and in compliance with all the GASB reports. Uh, they also review our internal control uh, to make sure that our process are in proper place and uh, they also check the appropriation of our expenditures and revenue. Um, Joseph Escobar is the manager representative of the firm IT Bailey. Uh, it says on our board agenda, Fabrinet, Trine, and Day, but they were acquired by IT Bailey. Uh, he's going to be presenting their findings, and the board members uh, can ask some clarifying questions. Thank you, Dorothy. Jeff for inviting me, thank you board for having me. Um, the opinion of I Bailey in regard to financial statements of Virginia uh, Union School District are that the financial statements are fair and reasonably stated in all material respects. Uh, we've provided an uh, unmodified or clean opinion. Uh, there are multiple opinions that are given. Uh, as Dorothy was stating, this includes the state uh, compliance requirements as well as the federal compliance requirements in both of those matters. No non-compliance was noted. Um, and additionally, in regards to internal controls, uh, there were no deficiencies uh, noted in terms of the internal controls. 
Uh, in addition to the district reports, we performed the audit for the Measure H fund as well, uh, for the bond performance audits. Uh, and that, we provide three opinions. Uh, one in regards to the financial statements, that was also an unmodified opinion. Uh, the internal controls, there were uh, no deficiencies or material weaknesses noted. And uh, lastly, we noted that there was uh, no non-compliance. Uh, so there was no matters of, uh, you know, were, uh, there was negative assurance in regards to the compliance. So there were no findings there as well. Great. Anybody have any clarifying questions they'd like to ask? Good for us, huh? I have uh, one question. Yes, it's about our, uh, the balance in our general fund. I, I don't know if it's possible to open up the annual report and um, go to page 60. Um, page 60? Page 60, please. It's the, um, it's the sort of the comparison schedule for the general fund. So the third column, well, yeah, I'll, I'll let, wait, Jeff, wait for Jeff to get there. Because you really can't read that, so uh, um, much like the other numbers. So I was wondering about the bottom row there. So basically, we, you have listed fund balance ending, and it's, um, you know, if we look at the actual, 34 million and change. Um, I thought the ending balance for the general fund is 31.4. Um, I, if you could take a I think there's like an Excel spreadsheet type error, but I want to make sure I'm not misreading this. Because we have a beginning balance of 31.9, that's consistent with my understanding. And then, um, anyway, I'll, I'll let you read that uh, for a second. And, um, I think what happened is um, you guys didn't subtract out the actual deficiency of 3.2 million. I, that's how I'm reading it because um, in the introduction it talks about 31.4 on page 20. In various other places we end up with 31.4. I just want to make sure there isn't an extra 3 million no. that you guys have found for us. The financials, <laughs> what you see on page the one, the uh, thirty-one point four. Let me see if that's the one. Um, yeah, if you uh, as what I would say, uh, as you can look at page seventeen. Right. That would be the total amount of the general fund. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to make sure that that's not that's sort of a typo and not um. Well, we found it somewhere. Yeah, sometimes there might be a reconciling uh, other special funds, special revenue funds that run through there mm -hmm. to make a gap. Uh, but I believe that is not the case for. So if we could correct that, if it turns out it is a typo, of course. Yeah, there's no reconciling factors on page 71, right. so absolutely. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right, anybody else have any clarifying questions? Okay, great. Um, and this is just information, so no action on that one. 11.3, um, Special Education Comprehensive Compliance Review. Good evening, um, louder than I expected. All right, so we were selected in 2008 uh, for a comprehensive review. And, <laughs> okay. So we, have, we do very many uh, reviews every year as special education department. Um, but most of them are based on information that we submit to the state, and they're limited to only a few performance indicators. Every once in a while, every district has to go through a very comprehensive review that looks at all indicators of very well-designed IEPs and assessments. It happens every four to five years or so. Um, so in 2018-19, we were 
we were told that we would be going through this, and the information that they were looking at from 2017, 18, and 1819. Um, so there are 14 indicators of really good IEP practices and assessment practices. Uh, they looked at all 14. There were six that didn't apply to us, so they had to do with things like secondary issues, sec uh, uh, graduation data, uh, uh, post-school outcomes, transition plans. And we had six in which we met our targets, which was really wonderful. Um, and they were, those areas were the areas of ELA and math participation, sorry, not participation, ELA and math, um, proficiency and, um, and in also in parent involvement. So parents consistently indicated that we involved them in the process, which is really, really important. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> All right, so this comprehensive review included um, on-site staff interviews, so 37 staff members, including special education and general education teachers, administrators, and service providers were interviewed. Parents were interviewed, 57 responded to a written survey. Uh, there was service verification review, which meant they looked at all the service logs that all of our service providers um, uh, keep and at, all, at 11 school sites. Uh, and they looked at, they pulled 50 IEPs, and they looked at all 50 through the lens of all the performance indicators. And then they also looked at all the district policies and procedures. Um, so the activities that the, the Cupertino Unified used to address the findings, and I'll go over the findings in a moment, but what we did once we were actually, um, oh, sorry, I'm looking the wrong one. My apologies. There we go. Uh, we, we went through, no, it's not it. My apologies, I had my slides out of order. Okay, so the findings. Um, so in general, I thought it was really good news looking back, look back on the findings. We had 82% of all the IEPs, all the interviews, all the, um, all the service logs, everything was found to be compliant. There were 3.1% found non-compliant, and 14.9% of all the things that they looked at were non-applicable. And some examples of non-applicable would be, uh, like they're looking at an IEP that's an annual, and they're looking at the performance indicators that have to do with assessments, they wouldn't be applicable because no assessments took place in that, in that annual. Okay. Um, so there were, Five areas where we had, where there were concerns that were found. Um, indicator three, which is participation in statewide assessments. So it's really important that all of our kids participate in statewide assessments every year. Um, it helps us to really gauge how our students are doing, and the fact that they have special education services shouldn't get in the way of that. It's a really important indicator. So, so the state looks at that very closely. Um, and I should tell you that the state sets the targets for all of, all of our work. Um, and those targets are set either by, um, by looking at what the average is at the state, so we're trying to get everybody up, everybody's game up a little bit, or there are some indicators that are just 100% just because it's expected. All right, so statewide assessments, and then 5B, least restrictive environment, and least restrictive environment is one of the cornerstones of special education. We are absolutely mandated to look at keeping students with their typically developing peers, with general education teachers, that is where we want them to be, unless we absolutely can't. And so we have very hard targets for that. Indicator 6A and B is preschool least restrictive environment, and it's a little different because the targets are different because um, because we haven't had very many school districts with general education options, and so we're trying to build them in districts across the state. Uh, and then indicator 11, eligibility evaluation, so it's looking at all the things that have to do with assessments, whether or not that we met our timelines to get the assessments done correctly, making sure the assessments themselves conform to best practice, 
um, and making sure that it, the, I, the psychologists and SLPs were really looking at all of the important issues. And then indicator 14 is non-compliant IEP. So those are all the, the possible things that you that you can do wrong, but also do right in an IEP. And I heard tell that there are approximately 856 possible compliance issues in every IEP. I don't know for sure that that's true, but it feels true. <laughs> all right. All right, now here's this one. Activities that we use to address these. So even though I think overall it was really good news, we always want to have a growth mentality and we always want to make things even better for our students. So what Cupertino Unified did was um, to address the 42 student level actions. Uh, we addressed 42 student level actions, so we held IEPs uh, to address the issues. We provided training on each of the 15 related topics at job alike meetings. We convened a subcommittee to look at um, the more deep, look more deeply into the root causes. We developed an action plan for every indicator, and we had a subcommittee that meets quarterly to monitor progress. All right, so now these are all the things that we were really looking at more closely. So when you look at this, this chart, the format is, reads as such. So on the left-hand side is the indicator that the state was looking at. The second column is our performance on that indicator. The third column was the target the state set for us. And the fourth column are things in the report itself that were cited by the, the state of California. Um, as either reasons that um, they think that, that things weren't going well or suggestions for us to remediate. So on participate, uh, excuse me, indicator three, participation in statewide perform assessments, um, our performance was 92.6% of students took the assessments, but the target was 95%. So we were a little bit over 3% low on that. The reasons cited in the report were that parents were opting out of our statewide assessments. Um, and what they said is that they felt that districts should increase parent education on the benefits because a lot of parents don't appreciate that this is important information for the district. All right. Indicator five, least restrictive environment. So our target was to have under 23.6% of students in special education, sorry, in general education, less than 80% of the day. And so basically, to flip it, they want us to have more than 80% of our kids in general education. Okay, so our target is 23, under 23.6, we were at 25.6. Again, a couple of percentage points off. And the reason cited our general education staff believes students learn better in specialized programs. That was in the report. The, when they did the, um, the on-site interviews, what our teachers tended to say is, you know, our kids really need this help. And they felt that that was what, the, what was the best for them. Um, and they, the state said we needed more training on how to support students with disabilities in general education. Indicator 6A and B, preschool least restrictive environment. So our target for 6A was 42%. So 42% so of students in preschool having at least some general education. Our performance at that time was 18.7% in general education. And this was at a time when we didn't have any general education preschool in the, in, in the district. Thank goodness the district has been working on that and we have Cooper Doodle now, so we really have some good opportunities. Um, and the reason cited were that we had too few preschool options at the time, which was true. Uh, and then uh, we also had a recording error. So we had, uh, this is a separate recording error that's on there. The recording error that I'm referring to is teachers didn't realize that when kids were in preschool programs that were privately placed, that they needed to record that on the IEP because they had general education options. And then 6B, um, our target is 79.5% of students placed, no, see, placed in separate schools. Um, we had recorded that we had 79.5% of students placed in separate schools, which was not true. <laughs> 
uh, for some reason, some of our teachers were marking the wrong box. So we just had to go back and do um, an edit on the IAPs. Yeah. All right, 11. Eligibility. So this is about our assessments. Uh, we needed to have, our target is 100% of all assessments on time, and our performance was 99.7%. So we're, again, pretty close. Um, and then we also had um, some missing components in our IEPs. And again, our target is 100%, no missing components. Some of the reasons cited are the uh, 0.03% of 60-day assessments not completed or not reviewed on time, so possibly completed but not reviewed. Assessment reports not provided to all parents was one of the issues that was found, so that's one of the components. Prior written notice was not always provided with the assessment plan, so explaining why we're proposing assessment, which is a really important part. And then uh, another missing component found was a bit that there was a missing statement that the assessment determined the effects of cultural, environmental, and economic factors. And then indicator 14, non-compliant IEPs, our target is zero. We're supposed to have them 100% compliant. We had 0.17% non-compliant of the 50 that, we, that were pulled. Uh, some of the reasons cited were linguistically appropriate goals, assessments, and services. So some of the, sometimes teachers forgot to mark the box. There was a goal for it that was linguistically appropriate for students with English language learning needs, but they forgot to check the box. Uh, sometimes progress for, for its goals was not included in the IEPs. Uh, necessary steps reflected in the IEP determine least restrictive environment. So although they may have had the conversation at the, at the meeting, they didn't record it in the IEP, which was necessary. Uh, sometimes goals in every identified area of need were not there, so they may have forgotten to develop a goal in one area. Uh, and then the consideration of potentially harmful effects of all placements being considered. The, at every IEP meeting when we're talking about placement, we're going to talk about how is each placement option going to affect the child? And as we know, everything in life has a, has a potential positive and negative outcome. So that needs to be discussed. And then, of course, having parent input in the notes in the IEP. All right, so another part of how the district is, is making changes to make sure that we are doing really the best supportive practice for our students is that there's been a reorganization. Um, in a large district like Cupertino, it's easy to have um, it's easier to have things fall off the radar and to not communicate or not know to go, who to go to. So the idea was to, to create small uh, teams to make it seem like um, they're, they're like little smaller districts. So we have five teams. So each five uh, the school is divided into five sets, five schools each. And each, so at the school site level, of course, it's all the, the team members who are working to support kids, the uh, general education, special education teachers, the site administrators, all the service personnel. And then as you go up, up, then the next step up is principals and psychologists and resource teachers are a, a, a resource for the school site. And then if there's still more needed information, then at that point, there's the program manager who supports the entire, the five schools, um, and to make sure that they provide training and they're a conduit of, of information from the district office down to the school site. And then from there, it goes up to district directors. Um, and so one director is assigned to each of the five, the five schools, and then from there is the EC members. And I think it's a really great model. And that's all. So we're looking forward to continuing to grow and do even better. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so does anybody have any clarifying questions that they'd like to ask Jennifer or Joe about this? Uh, so I did have one question regarding the 82% um, um, the findings slide. I think it's the third slide. Given that the 14.9 is actually non-applicable, 
So it's not, so the, the, the percentage calculation puts that into the formula, even though they were kind of NA okay. for the not calculating that formula. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of clarify that for me? So I didn't make that calculation. This was directly from the report. So I'd have to do some math on if we took out the 14.9, then what percentage would that be? I'm not sure how to answer that at this point. If you'd like me to come back to this. What is your reason for asking? I, I mostly just want to, because it, the way that the report is stated, it seems like we're like an 82% right. on a test right. is, is a B minus, right? So, <laughs> so. Yeah, that's, that doesn't quite work. It doesn't, it's yes. not, but it's not exactly. No, because no matter what, the, the, um, the relative thing is that 3.1%, we're not compliant, right? Because no matter how you look at it, of what was looked at, whether it was unapplicable or it was um, compliant, it's the 3.1 we have to worry about, right? Right. So, yeah. okay. It is a weird way that they do that. It, it's like, why not just leave that out and say what percent of what you did do that matters? That would have been nice, but that's not what they did. Yeah. So this is a line with Sylvia's question again. So wh what does it mean for us, like if 3.1 uh, percentage, we are not compliant? I mean, are we, are we still considered as good, very good, excellent, or uh, we are like kind of in average school? So I don't have all the state's statistics to tell you how we relate to others. Um, I would say, like I said, with 856 potential issues in every IEP, 3.1% is, is, I think it's pretty good, not as good as I want us to be. Uh, so two questions. One is just information. Also, you talked about pulling 50 IEPs for review. I'm just wondering, as a district, um, how many IEPs are we sort of supporting right now? Roughly. As of today, it's 1,290. 1290. Okay. I'm just looking at it. All right, so it's a sample size of a couple percent. And, and I think you may have answered my second question, which is I'm, I'm wondering on that last item when you said there's 0.17 percent that's non-compliant. I was wondering. If you're looking at 50 plants, how do you get a point one? Each plant would be two percent. So it looks like the unit of measure you're using are the specific items inside the plants as opposed to plants as a whole. I just want to make right. sure. Right. Okay. Yes, exactly. Because every IEP has a certain number of things that they're looking at. Right. And, and you said it's roughly around 800. Uh, how, how many I, um, so, so it's a question about unit of measure, right? You, you're talking about so percent of something. We so. were just looking at it. We have, we have a little over 1,500 IEPs that we held last year. Okay, all right. Um, but you didn't review them all, you reviewed 50. Right, so and I didn't know this. Right, example 50. 50. I, I guess 0.17 of, I, I guess maybe I'm not making myself clear. Yeah. If we were looking at how many IEPs were non compliant, that'd be either get 2%, 4%, 6%. I, I, that's misstated here. So, uh, the, point the, the, num the number is, uh, I realize that now, uh, you're right, this, this number is of the, within the 50, right. the number of things that could be compliant or non-compliant, 3.1. So it could be one IEP of the 50 has several other, right? So, is that because it says here it's actually a, a compliant, total compliant findings, not of IEPs. It is true on another place we talked about it being of IEPs, but I don't think that's right. I think it's of the... I guess I'm trying to understand that we've, because you could imagine all the problems being with one IEP, in which case it impacts one person, or you could have one item wrong with a bunch of things, in which case it impacts a lot of folks. So because it seems like there are different measures here. So I just want to get a sense for, at a high level, you know, I'm not looking for a specific answer, but what's your sense of good IEPs, compliant IEPs? What percent is that? Because 0.17 tells me, is that like one or two, or is it? Um, so they didn't tell us any, oh. uh, how many of the IEPs were 100% compliant. Okay. They looked at all 50. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And all said right. there were, of, of all the possible errors across all the 50, how many non compliance okay. issues were there? All right. It is true that it doesn't, doesn't help us a lot, right? Is it? Is it five really bad IEPs, or is it a couple things here and there in each of them, or what, right? Yeah, I got it. Right, thank you. 
Anybody else before I do mine? All right. Um, so my question, uh, the very last slide where we're talking about sort of our, our support structure that we've got in place now. Where, so I noticed, you know, one of our findings was about uh, LREs on our, on our preschool students. Where in our new support structure does our, our preschool fall? So they are attached to school sites that are a part of the, the five. So, so they're not separated out as um, just our preschool. It's, it's whatever site they are assigned to. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Good job. Okay. So moving on to discussion. Um, so 12.1, our update on our next generation science standards, learning model, and recommendations. Uh, Allison and Marie, I believe, right? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Good evening, trustees. I'm very excited to also have um, some science teachers here. Um, actually, we have more science teachers than I thought were going to be here, um, which is really exciting. Um, but I've invited um, Krista Gaffney, who is um, a science chair over at CMS right here, and I believe your seventh grade, please? Yes. And then Hammy Out, I'm going to say your last name wrong, Aoji. Aoji. Um, he is a Kennedy science chair and seventh grade as well. Yeah. So it's really lovely to have so many um, science teachers here tonight. Um, these guys were going to share with me, just share a little bit more. So Krista and Hamby, if you want to come up, that would be great. Um, so I'll just kick it off but I also want to give them an opportunity to talk with you as well. Recently, we were involved in a lot of discussions, so um, all of the science teachers worked diligently together in multiple meetings, and um, we're going to share with you the results. So um, our purpose is to provide an update on, a pro on the process that we went through and um, our recommendation for the science learning model moving forward for grades six through eight. Um, we're also going to be presenting some themes that came out from the staff and parent community. So I was able to meet with um, some parent groups and I saw a couple of you there too. Thank you very much for joining. And then um, we're going to share out the recommendation that the teachers are making. Um, and we also request from you um, for direction, especially in terms of informing our selection for instructional materials. So um, that can come out from your discussion, hopefully. So I want to share with you, once again, I know I've talked with you multiple times about um, the two different learning models. I have a new graphic for you. I don't know if that helps or not. Um, so the two different ways that we are looking at um, the instructional part, so that's one of the dimensions of ne next generation science standards, the disciplinary core ideas, that's what we're kind of drilling down into now, the content, how is it being taught. Um, as we pilot, this is one of the things that we had to look at. Um, do we want to go in a discipline specific way or integrated? With the pilot, actually, it doesn't really impact the pilot. We're looking at the cohesion with next generation science standards, and we're just testing out one unit. But when it comes to teaching, we need to know which direction we're going in. So uh, the discipline specific is what we're familiar with. It's what's happening right now. And the idea is that in sixth grade, we really focus deeply on Earth and space. In seventh grade, we focus deeply in uh, life science, and then in eighth grade, physical science. There are places where um, we can go, we can integrate the different disciplines in, and that is important to help um, deepen the understanding. But the idea the idea is that you go very deep into one of the disciplines. Um, and there's ways to make connections between those, those concepts within that discipline to go super deep. So um, 
the, the dimensions of NGSS that I've talked with you before about are present in that. In the integrated model, there's more of a spiral effect. So we have the initial levels of six of uh, life science, earth science, and physical science in sixth grade, and then we spiral up and go a little bit deeper in seventh grade, spiral up and go a little bit deeper in eighth grade. Um, and so the spiraling um, happens throughout. It, it starts in sixth grade and moves all the way through. It was the initial design for NGSS, and it is considered the preferred model for California. However, discipline specific is also fully accepted by California. Um, the cross-cutting concepts um, are more evident between the different disciplines as, as students travel through, but they are evident in both, so in discipline specific as well as in integrated. So those are the two different um, learning models that we looked at. So we did a lot of work together. And I'm going to ask these guys to share out, too. I'm just going to set the stage and, and give them an opportunity to share feedback. Um, we met with approximately 50 middle school teachers. And um, we collaborated in both November and December. Uh, and then there were even some catch-up sessions for those that missed out. So um, there was a lot of work that happened. We looked at a number of documents, including our strategic plan, and we deeply considered both models. And the teachers then participated in a structure that is similar to what they do in their classrooms. It was claim, evidence, and reasoning. And they engaged in um, deep debate and very, very um, respectful debate with each other. And at the end of the day, um, for the first, for the learning day, we didn't have consensus, and I had shared that with you before. But at the end of the second session, when we went really deep, um, there was about a 75% consensus for a discipline-specific model. And I know I have a typo there that it was actually December 2019, not 2020. <laughs> um, and. Um, those results were in alignment with the survey that I had shared with you last spring. Uh, we didn't have everybody participate in that survey, so we were a little concerned about that, and there wasn't all of that robust conversation. In this, we had everybody participate in the most recent uh, meeting. So I'm wondering if you guys could just give a little bit about how that was for you as science teachers and what you noticed for um, for the other teachers that were a part of it? <laughs> Hi, good evening. Thanks for coming and listening to our conversations here. Um, so during this big discussion process that we had, um, it was really helpful to be able to meet with all the science teachers across the district. We don't get to do that often, so it was a really great experience for us to just be able to meet together as a big group. So that was really exciting for us to start with. Um, and then we got to review a lot of materials that were set up for us. So a lot of these materials had um, evidence-based. So there was evidence about the two different models, so evidence about integrated and evidence about discipline-specific, um, how they've been working in other districts so far, the districts that have implemented both. Um, and then there was evidence about um, using the actual framework, right, so the framework of how the standards were written. And so we used those along with the strategic plan to help us um, gather some evidence for which would be the best option for our students. Um, and so that was kind of the lens we were looking through, is what is the best for our students going through. And so what we were doing was communicating with each other. In fact, Anthony and I were partners. Um, and so we got to communicate with each other and um, come up with our evidence to back up our individual claims. Um, and then we got to question each other. And so question, um, you know, why did you choose that evidence? Where did you find that piece of data? Um, what did you think was so important about it? And so we got to really question each other, um, dig deeper, dive deeper. There was a lot of listening involved. There was a lot of thinking involved, challenging each other, and pushing each other to think further about why you were choosing um, the particular thought that you had. So it was a really great experience to be able to talk and listen to one another. So it was really great. Uh, yeah, the, the conversations we had, the collaboration was uh, very valuable. Um, I think 
the biggest takeaway and value of it in some ways is looking at the, they both have limitations and they both have, they both work fine, uh, but really looking at the limitations um, and thinking going forward how we need to work with that. Uh, so I think that was probably the most valuable part of the conversations we had. All right, so I'm gonna just share with you where we landed. Um, so the recommendation, again, was discipline specific and there's rationale that we have and you guys can certainly share more. Um, the rationale that, that collectively we gathered was that um, students ben will benefit from the opportunities of the focused, rigorous learning within the concentrated discipline. There was a concern that um, it was possible with integrated that we wouldn't go deep enough, and that was something the teachers really wanted to have um, the ability to do. Um, also, we would be utilizing um, the expertise of our science teachers um, to the greatest extent possible. Um, and they would still be able to teach in a three-dimensional way um, with all of those aspects of NGSS to, to have a really robust, exciting learning experience. Another piece that isn't a, a small thing to overlook is that we can implement new curriculum immediately. Uh, with a, an integrated approach, there's a lot of shuffling and changing so that kids don't miss out on key content. And that's a lot of logistics that would need to take place and it would take about two to three years to um, have a fully integrated plan in place. So there was a concern of that, just really wanting to jump in right away. And then um, teachers can really focus on integrating those really great practices that NGSS is calling for us to um, weave in. And that is what we felt would really serve our kids the very best on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm wondering if you guys have anything else that you'd want to share? Um, one thing that did come up in the conversations also was being labeled as discipline specific. That doesn't separate from being integrated. Uh, in my class, th throughout the year, uh, I teach life science, but I'm still constantly bringing up and um, integrating the earth science and the physical science when it's appropriate. So it's, it's not exclusive of being integrated. Okay, thank you. Um, I also wanted to just share a little bit about the um, community feedback. I, I was um, disappointed that I didn't get more people to fill out my survey. I had six people in total fill it out. And um, I, I, in total, I think I saw about 50 community members from an evening meeting as well as the morning meeting. And I really, I did try to get people to fill out that survey. <laughs> You guys can uh, uh, verify that. Um, so there was a mixed um, amount of information, you know, well, feedback that they were giving. Um, some, some of the community members were reflecting on their own learning experience and they worried that kids in sixth grade would forget everything by the time they hit eighth grade. Um, there is more integrating that happens than what it might appear in this, and teachers do revisit concepts, so it's not a, you know, one shot and we're done. Um, there were also, on the other side, uh, parents that really felt strongly that we should be working with teacher um, expertise, and they also shared that they felt like um, kids should have this experience of the discipline specific because it models more of what happens in high school. So um, I had a mixed bag of feedback and um, I just wanted to share that with you as well. And then moving forward, just considering um, what we need to really 
uh, focus on with a discipline-specific model. There are some challenges. So professional development, that could be um, a limited resource. However, we feel like we're not just going to focus on the publishers to learn new curriculum, um, but we also want to deeply focus on NGSS. Um, and, and then we also want to build our collaborative network. Uh, you know, before this meeting, I was talking with Krista, and she was just sharing about this amazing lab that they had today that she had just designed with RJ. And like those sorts of things where they were doing a pendant square, and it was really cool. That needs to get out there. So all of these teachers are doing really cool things. And we need to have the opportunity to be able to collaborate and share and really strengthen our practices across. And I think that's where we're going to have great professional development. We can have input, but also collaboration. The, the CAST assessment um, is an integrated assessment. So that's something that we also need to address about like looking at different sample assessments and how we can support you know, to be honest, the eighth grade teachers have all along been the ones that have carried the load of the assessment for science. So we haven't had separate sixth and seventh grade assessments with um, our standards, standards based, well, our, our, our end of the year assessments. The, the main CASP test, or CAST, is in eighth grade. So we think that we can address this with a toolkit and with just revisiting um, how um, students may be assessed. Um, and then um, there, there has been a question about the teacher credentialing piece. We don't know what the answer is until we um, actually adopt curriculum but we're pretty certain that we can address any HR concerns. I know, Stacy, you could speak to that, of course. Um, so we're, we're optimistic on that. And then um, we just, again, really, we need to design ways and opportunities for, for teachers to be able to integrate in these um, the other disciplines into what they're doing, and it already is happening, but we need to share that out. So again, more collaboration. Um, we were talking before this meeting about ways to to build, um, you know, maybe lesson studies or just ways to, to look deeply and work together. So that's our next step, and we're going to be thinking about it. We're not there yet, but it's it's going to be coming down. Um, as we uh, finish our piloting phase. So that's everything for you to consider. Again, we're, um, I would love to hear from you if there are things that we need to consider as we're con completing this pilot phase and um, just take into consideration. And I, again, just really want to thank the science teachers for being here. They stayed here pretty late. <laughs> So um, it shows you their commitment to this. So thank you. Okay. So uh, with that, we'll open it up. Anybody who's got any questions, go ahead. I don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you. And I'm so glad we have teachers here. I love hearing from teachers. So thank you both for joining us tonight. Okay. Hey, Satish. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hall. And um, I think I have a couple of questions when we are selecting um, discipline versus integrating. Uh, or at least my thinking is probably picking the blocks. Probably, probably that may be much more effective. Um, uh, we, within the block, what I mean is you start in sixth grade, go to the seventh, the next level, and eighth, so on, because the maturity of the students also. Like, you know, when you're going in a sixth grade, for example, Earth and Space, you're going deeper and deeper. Probably, are they really capable of, you know, grasping all those things? Because by then they get into eighth grade, probably there's, support, there's much more chances for them to be successful, you know, than being in sixth grade to learn a subject in a deeper way. Okay. 
Did we consider that? Did we talk about that? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, we did talk about that a lot. And um, there are ways, there are ways that we, um, I'm going up into it. <laughs> so there was science, the eighth grade unit there, there were um, lots of connections. So, you know, they were working on waves, learning about how waves work, and then there was this whole piece on cochlear implants, which was really a nice connection, and then how the eye works. So bringing in the life science into this physical science, it is, it is sprinkled throughout the curriculum that we're looking at. So even though it is, um, it's designated discipline specific. There are ways that it's it's being brought together. So I don't know if, if you guys So if I'm if I'm understanding your question, you asking about how integrated is is getting deeper and deeper as you go? Okay. So the curriculum integrated was designed that way, so it was written with the intent for it to get deeper and deeper. So it is a concern that we are thinking about how if we choose a curriculum that is discipline specific, sometimes, yes, they do pick up the units and just move them around. So it is something that we're looking very, very carefully at to make sure that it is developmentally appropriate for each grade level because integrated was written that way. It was written so that it is developmentally appropriate for each one. That's what we were looking at in the framework when we looked at all of our evidence. Um, I think we shared those docs too. So um, it is something that we are considering and are looking at because um, for discipline curriculum, um, it is possible for them to just pick up and move it. So we are checking very carefully to see um, if it's going to match the right level. So that's something that we are going to watch for, um, or we might have to change ourselves. Is that it? Yeah, I think uh, my concern mainly was the lower the grade, right? Like when you're in the sixth grade, your capability to learn a subject in depth versus a, a eighth grade and no brainer, no big issues when you compare, because they are the highest level. So probably they can go in any level, or they better be, kind of, right? So sixth grade, you are expecting kind of a learning ability of an eighth grader in a specific subject. Do we have that, right? So. Yeah. Um, well, I think that uh, we have incredibly bright students here, and that was part of a challenge where we wanted to make sure that we were we were going super deep and challenging kids at each of the grade levels. Um, and for kids to hang on to it, we've been we think that they can, and we're going to be that's the collaboration part where we're going to be working together to really make sure that we have different touch points throughout those different years to be able to connect more. So it, it is possible. And I know these teachers are so dedicated that um, we're gonna find ways to make sure that we, we meet the students' needs. They're absolutely dedicated <coughs> to our students. Anything else? Do you only want clarifying questions or are we doing discussions? Uh, let's finish around with clarifying questions and then we'll decide if we need another round or if we should head into discussion now. Yeah? Sure. Okay. Let me decide if my question is a discussion <laughs> question or a clarifying question. Sorry. Jerry, you want to go? Um, I, I don't have any. I have comments. I don't have any clarifying questions. Okay, same here. So, then does anybody have any other true clarifying questions before we move on to more comments, considerations, discussion? Okay, so we'll roll into that. Um, so, Jerry, you want to start us off on? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so, of course, I really want to thank the 
uh, teachers uh, for, I know there's been a lot of lively discussions around uh, the selection, and I think that really reflects the dedication that you put into the learning experience uh, for, the, for our kids. So I just want to say thank you for that. And, and really thank you for taking us all through this process. And really, um, I know, you know, a couple of months when you first came, it looked like, wow, we're all over the place. And I think going through this process and kind of getting us somewhere in a sort of a, um, you know, evidence-based way, I really appreciate that. And so thank you also for this. Um, I'm actually pretty happy with this. I think, you know, I certainly respect um, the opinions and the judgment of our teachers and if there's some, you know, two-thirds, over two-thirds that are happy with this model, it's certainly one that um, I would support. I would just, you know, so a couple of comments. You know, we talked about the considerations, so you know, I, I'm glad you had a slide on what, we, what might be some of the weaknesses, quote unquote, right, if we go with a discipline specific model. And so some of these ideas in terms of sharing sample assessments, having some collaborative networks seem like good ideas. And I would just ask that, um, is there a way to sort of check on this um, sometime down the line to see if sharing these sample assessments are effective and if we should, I know I, I work in an office where sometimes I feel like the executives solve problems by saying, you all collaborate and then it all be good. And, and I, I would hope that we have the resources to put some um, affordances in there. So I also just want to say how impressed I am with the, the thorough and really um, thoughtful process that you all went through voice was given to all different opinions and respected and really the discussion is so well thought out. So I want to thank it and then all the teachers and Marie for, for leading the whole thing. It took a long time um, to, to even get to the point where there was a, a consensus. So I really appreciate the work that that took. I know to get all 50 of you to go on a mandatory learning day and um, we know that that is dedication. So thank you for that. Um, and I did also have a, a comment, um, more than a, a, well, I guess I do have questions too, but. So in terms of the collaborative thing that you were saying, I think Marie, you mentioned yesterday at the parent, um, Mom. the models, models the, that um, some of the teachers hadn't seen each other in 20 years um, from the different school sites. And so, the value of being able to have that collaboration, not just in the science department at the school, but across all the different sites. And so I would love to see as part of the plan going forward that there is more of that intentional um, programmatic collaboration, like Jerry was saying, but to, to create maybe whether that's you know scheduled time or, or whatever that is, because I do agree there's so much that can be learned from each other. Um, so I, I'd want that to be <coughs> in consideration. I did have a little bit of a question about, um, Marie, you can maybe answer this. With the fact that MGSS is, is preferring the integrated K through 12, but then most of the high schools we know, none of them are integrated, right? So it's a, maybe, it's a little, yeah, it's a little strange. The, the choice, well, K-5 didn't really have a choice. And it isn't as integrated as you would think. It's, it's a little more coordinated. Um, but the curriculum is, is definitely um, making changes. The, the publishers are, are making changes to make those connections. Um, in high school, their choice was either a three-year plan or a four-year plan. They could have gone integrated. I don't think any high school has gone integrated, but some of uh, uh, most have gone with a three-year plan, weaving in earth science in every year. So it was kind of easier for high school. There was nothing that K-5 had to do, and everything just fell on middle school, um, this big decision that needed to be made, and that was unfortunate. And my understanding is that the curriculums that we're looking at are modular anyway, right? So, so there are certain chapters or topics that could be taken yes. out of a particular discipline and put into a different discipline just to yes. create some of that, right? Yeah, and our teachers did an amazing job before we even started with this in looking at maybe a hybrid model. So they've, are, they've had a lot of discussion in the cadre about um, ways that that could happen, and I've heard from science teachers that 
They would love to be able to bring in more earth science into seventh grade right before they go to Yosemite. So, so there's connections that are already um, pieces that they're interested in, and I think as we talk and work together, we can find ways to do that. I'll, I'll ask one more step. Um, you said that 26 parents give the feedback. Uh, yes. Is it too low? Like, uh, because my worry is that uh, we are pushing something and uh, how, because truly students probably may not be able to give the feedback because it's graded. Or I don't know, I don't think any mention was there that we have taken feedback from students anyway. Not on this, because I think it would be really confusing, um, but we are gathering feedback from the pilots, so we're definitely listening to them for that. And I just want to clarify that feedback that I received was from the parents who came to the meeting, mm -hmm. and I, I asked them to give me feedback on, uh, in a form, and um, they, didn't, they didn't fill it out, so I think that maybe that is you know, information too, that maybe they didn't feel like they had a strong opinion either way, they just wanted to come and listen. I'm not sure, but I was disappointed. Yeah, because I see that, um, well, or the feedback what you receive from the parents are more discipline specific, right? Mm -hmm. Not on the integrated <coughs> yeah. perspective. So it would have been nice if you But it was like yeah. five people and then one person, and and lot. I'll just add, as a, as a current parent, so I got the email inviting me to it, I got an email reminder that I had signed up to attend it, and I think I also got a follow-up email inviting me to do <laughs> so. There, there were and many we opportunities the slides. provided to us. Oh, and in addition to Marie um, asking in a, you know, repeated fashion, would you please you know, use the QR code to, if that were in the slides of the presentation. So I think effort, it wasn't for lack of, you know, effort or trying. Was, I think it's sometimes we can be the first war, but we can't always make them drink, right? So. Yeah, we, we can continue to look for the opportunities to go forward, but I mean, it is what it is. We did everything we possibly could to get it, but I think through the piloting and other, we'll just continue to find the other feedback that people are messing us with the deal. So, I have a couple, yeah? Okay. Um, so, as you're sort of looking now to what next steps are in implementation and sort of hashing out, you know, finishing out the pilot and <coughs> what that's all going to look like. Um, just some considerations I have. Um, I, um, you know, would echo everything everybody said about so much appreciating the process and the time it was taken and all the input and all the work um, on behalf of all the staff and all the teachers and, um, you know, I, I trust that this was the consensus that everybody came to, that um, everybody's committed to, to making that work. Um, so I guess my comments on that would just be, um, I know one of the things you expressed was there was a lot of um, really careful consideration about um, which model would allow for providing the rigor that our students are ready for, and I would just ask that as we're going through the pilot process, I, I guess I'm, I'm looking forward to sort of hearing about um, you know, which aspects of the curriculum that we're piloting um, really allow for that rigor, and then also um, making sure that we have um, a really good sense of, of how those curricula and what comes out of the pilot is ready to support um, making it accessible for our special populations. Because not all of our students may be um, at a point to access, you know, the level of rigor that, 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 that you know, may be typical. So um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, I know that one of the big pieces of, of just kind of common core in general was this idea of um, enabling students who were transferring um, between districts to maybe have um, uh, more continuity and have there be less opportunities for gaps in learning. And so, um, you know, if, if we're kind of going down one path and other districts are going down another path and the state has set up this system where, where they're saying, you know, both can meet the needs of students, I just want to make sure that as, as we're thinking for implementation, I guess I'd like to see something about that we're, you know, right now maybe in the first year because everybody's coming off a discipline-specific model, it's not going to be such a big deal, but that long-term we're ready to support any students who are coming in from 
um, you know, districts that may be operating under an integrated model to make sure that we're, we're ready to support any gaps that might be there in learning, um, you know, coming into, into our decision with the integrated model. Um, and then my other one, um, I know you brought up, you know, that um, credentialing concerns have come up. Um, and I have, you know, every confidence that, that a plan will be put in place um, to help support that. I would just ask that, um, you know, that we're really um, conscious about uh, making sure that we have the resources and the budget in place too as a part of um, the curriculum adoption to make sure that we're doing our part to help meet the needs that I think may arise out of um, going, you know, su supporting this decision. So, um, you know, just, just being mindful of, of, you know, maybe when we have a result of the pilot and have a better idea of how many credential issues we may or may not have, or, or even just, you know, be it waivers, be it additional authorizations, whatever it is that we're just ready to roll with supporting that right away to make that transition as soon as possible for supporting the And I think that's it. Anybody else have any other comments they want to make? Okay. So, are you on the house? <laughs> All right. I'm so interested in you know, like a, a nod or a direction forward kind of a, anything at this point. I think what my sense is that we're supportive of going down this path as long as we take all of these ideas into consideration. And then we will come back to you later this year with an update on piloting and if we're ready to make a recommendation for adoption then we would do that at that time. We've also told the teachers So our plan is to come back to you with a recommendation this spring for adoption, um, considering this path and all of the pieces of feedback that you've shared. Um, if through that process we feel like we're not finding the right fit, then we would bring that information forward as well. We've talked to the teachers about that, that we want to be sure it's the right decision um, and all things are lining up for our kids. Thank you so much, Marie and team. Okay. Back to this one. Okay, so discussion, action. Um, we have the 13.1 uh, approval of the new job description and salary range for warehouse lead person. So, Stacey. Hi, good evening. So, I wanted to uh, provide some background as to this position because it is a new position. Um, at the end of last year, we had retirement. We also had some promotions within the warehouse department that really allowed us an opportunity to stop and look at before we filled positions. How do we best meet the needs of the department, knowing where we are going forward, and giving us a chance to reflect. So at that time, we started looking, how do we do some restructuring? How do we uh, make the most efficient department without costing money? And so this position has actually been worked on for about six months. Many, many, many meetings and reiterations with the SEIU I'm just really looking at how do we capture everything into one job description that isn't a huge elevation in cost, um, but it also allows a leadership role to emerge through SEIU. What we've done with all of the departments under SEIU is we've tried to develop a lead position, which really is that liaison between workers and the manager. We're going to continue to have some shifts in the warehouse and purchasing department from the retirement that just happened, so this really was a cost-effective way to, to be a very efficient department. And so we brought it as an action discussion because we hadn't talked about it. We've been talking about it again internally for probably six months and have done many changes on and gone through the job description. What do we want to make sure is in there? And we really feel like this is a good solid position. We'd like to have it as an ex internal position so that one of our current employees can take on this lead position. Questions, comments, discussion? Is there something maybe we could do a, a motion and second and then discuss it if needed? Are people comfortable with that? Alright. Can I take a motion first and then if we need to discuss it again? Great. Close those. We can second this. Satish seconds. Okay. So anybody have any discussion or comments? Uh, and just a uh, question. So how are 
why the these uh, responsibilities being filled today? Is it being filled by a variety of roles or uh, positions? Or so we eliminated a position when somebody retired last year, so it had been sitting vacant. So we really went through what some of their responsibilities were that we still needed and pulled that out, plus looked at what our typical leads do and reconfigured it in a completely new job description. So some things that were in the old job description really were outdated that we didn't need to have, and some things just life has changed in their environment, and so we had to amend those into the job description. So well. from an HR perspective, or is, is there an old job description or a whole role that's being eliminated and replaced with this one? Is that, is that um, what you Replaced and enhanced. Replaced and enhanced. That's a better way to look at it. All right, thank you. Anybody else? Right, are we ready to take action to approve this? Right, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And any discussions? Thank you. Motion carries 5 0. Oh, thank you, Stacy. Okay, uh, so moving on 13 2, approval of the 2021 board meeting dates. Craig, you are on point. Yeah. Um, well, you know, you received the dates. There is this revised one. Uh, Phyllis reminded us that December 3 will be uh, the CSBA uh, conference. So, uh, in anticipation of people going to that, we will, would, are recommending now this change of December 10 and then the 17th. Uh, that, that will be back to back. And, you know, we try to avoid that generally, but it's fine to do one like that, I think. Okay. That's the recommendation. And I have not received, other than that, there have been other uh, recommendations for changes. So let's get a motion and then we can discuss it here. I move to approve this uh, presented board meeting calendar. Okay, Jerry moves a second. I'll second. Tisha seconds. Okay, any discussion or further comments on the meetings coming for next year? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Um, so, fourteen uh, approval of revised job description and salary range for human resources analysts. Is this something, uh, it's an action item, so maybe uh, <coughs> take a motion second. Motion and then if you uh, have it, if Stacey wants to say something, you have a question. Great. Okay, so can I get a motion? I'll move that. Um, so, any uh, discussion, questions for Stacey on this? Just as a clarification versus the other job description, this one actually came through the reclassification process as part of the contract. So, it was agreed upon last year under CSEA. It has taken us um, seven months to really come to a good job description again working with CSEA going back and forth and looking at the job description who it applies to so we have spent an enormous amount of time with CSEA but this was actually something that came through the negotiations last year and was in March and April it's just been a long time coming. Okay. Question comments? Okay. Okay. So, uh, Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Stacey. All right, 15, moving on. Board and Superintendent Activity uh, and Committee Reports. Anybody want to start? I'll start. Don't worry. Jerry doesn't have anything. Okay. Anybody else? I know, because I'm remembering back before the holidays. Day. Day. <laughs> I don't remember. Um, and I didn't make any notes for myself either, so I think, Craig, that leaves you. Uh, I'll pass. We're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and then moving on to 16, agenda setting. Um, so we have already talked about the location of the board advance, uh, and um, any, there was kind of a call for, just as a reminder, if you have anything for the 123 agenda that you want to um, move back to the committee on regarding moment to forward that to Craig and then um, anything else anybody's wanting to see on the agendas? Okay. Yeah, we, 
we have a lot coming up, actually. Between all the budget things and the enrollment, uh, we're, we're going to be pretty uh, ensconced in it, I think, for a while. And um, I had to remind myself here with the start of the new year to go back and take a look at the year at a glance calendar, so don't forget that's there, too. Um, and uh, anything else before we adjourn back to closed session? So we're going to adjourn back to closed session.